thank you so much for uh, accepting to give a talk, a virtual talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, to the organizers, especially to Julien for, for this kind invitation. I'm very happy and honored to, to present this work in, in, in Newcomb, in Montreal, even, even in spiritual. So I'm going to talk about some joint work with Bamsi, Pingali, and, and Chen Yan Yao from Bangalore and Shanghai Tech. And this, uh, this work is about vortices. So let me start with recapping, recalling some, some basic stuff about the classical theory of, of abelian vortices on a Riemann surface. And then I will move on to the situation of, of my main interest, which is when the vortices um, back react uh, to, to the metric on the, on the Riemann surface. So the abelian vortex equations given by, by this equation here, or for a Hermitian metric H on a line bundle of a Riemann surface with a, with a section phi, a holomorphic section. And then uh, they are written like this. So here, FH is the curvature of the chair connection of H. And then I have this, and uh, this is a star is the, the Hodge star operator. And then you have this other term, which is the norm phi, the norm squared of, of the holomorphic section <coughs> with respect to H. And then, Things depend on a, on a choice of parameter tau, which is a positive constant. These equations are a generalization of the, of the equations introduced by Kingsford and Landau in the theory of, of superconductivity. And the other thing I have to say is that in order to write equations, I need to fix some background metric G on the, on the Riemann surface. So, <clears throat> In the first part of, in the very first part of my talk, the metric is going to be fixed. Okay, so the equations depend on this pair of data given by the fixed background metric on the Riemann surface and this constant tau. So because of the physical interpretation, typically this tau is called the symmetry breaking parameter for reasons that will come more clear later. And the other uh, comment they have to make is that in this physical setup, the churn connection represents the electromagnetic field and phi is the electron wave function density <coughs> in this theory of, of Kingsborough and Landau. So vortices, abelian vortices, have been studying uh, quite a lot in the, in the math literature and mainly all the, all the more recent works are inspired by initial works by Jeff and Taus in the Euclidean plane and, and within on the two-dimensional Minkowski space time. So if we assume if we assume that the Riemann surface is compact, then the existence problem for abelian vortices was solved by Noguchi, Bradlow, and Garcia Prada independently with different methods. And the main existence results states as follows. <clears throat> so let L be a holomorphic line bundle over a compact Riemann surface sigma with fixed Kelemetric G, and then you fix a section which is holomorphic on the line Mendeley. We fix also this parameter tau. Then the abelian vortex equations admit a solution edge if and only if the following, uh, there is the following bound on the parameter tau with respect to the <coughs> degree of the line bundle, which is n, and the volume of the metric. Okay. And in that case, the solution is unique. So notice that I'm writing the equations in a slightly different form. So before I wrote a star FH here, and now I'm writing the trace of the curvature with respect to the Keller form. It's not really the Keller metric, but the Keller form in the Riemann surface. Okay, so I'm assuming my, my metric to be Keller. Okay, let me, let me give you an idea of how this theorem works, because it's going to be useful for later. Are there any questions about the statement? Okay, so let me go on. So the proof is, is as follows. So assume first that you have a solution. Then the abelian vortex equation is the same as this thing here by taking Hodge star, where omega is the Keller form, or you want in this case is the volume form of the, of the remaining metric. 
and then integrating, we obtain the following. 4 pi n, 4 pi times the degree, plus del 2 norm of phi minus tau times the volume. This is the total volume of the metric, of the Riemann surface with respect to the metric, this is zero. And therefore, <clears throat> since this is positive, this implies precisely the inequality that we were aiming for. Okay, so this part is very easy. It's, it's just amounts to, to integrating over the, integrating the equation over the, over the surface. The other part, the existence, is more complicated. So let me explain an idea by, by Garcia Prada in his thesis. So assume now that uh, we have this bone on the on the tau, this lower bone on tau, and then <clears throat> using the section phi, we can consider we can cook up a SU2 equivariant bundle on the product of the Riemann surface time P1. This is this is an extension given by the, the, bundle, the bundle is rank two, and here we have the pullback of the line bundle L on sigma to X. P is the projection into sigma. Here we have the pullback by Q, which is the projection into P1 of O2. And then this extension, this holomorphic extension is determined by phi uniquely because we have an identification between the smooth holomorphic, sorry, the holomorphic sections of, of, of the line bundle with a, H1 of the endomorphisms uh, from here to there. Okay. So the idea is that any section fixes a, a holomorphic uh, extension of this sort. And then taking this specific choice of Keller form, so you take the pullback of your omega, of some omega, some Keller form omega, and then, uh, sorry, the pullback of your, of your fixed Keller form omega, plus uh, four over tau of the pullback of the Fubini story metric, then this bundle E is a slope stable with respect to the Keller class of omega tau, if and only if this bound on tau holds. And furthermore, this E admits a Hermite Einstein metric, if and only if L admits a solution of the abelian vortex equation. Okay, I, I should have to explain what, what is uh, the Hermitian metric, uh, Hermitian metric, but essentially this is just given by, um, well, the contraction of the curvature for a metric on the on the vector bundle with the with the Keller form to be proportional to the identity. Okay, this is the Hermitian condition. Then, with these two observations at hand, in hand, automatically. The theorem follows from the application of the donaldson ullenberg yau theorem. donaldson ullenberg yau tells us that if we have a slope-stable bundle, then it admits a Hermitian symmetric. So if we have this bound, we have a slope-stable bundle, therefore it admits a Hermitian symmetric, therefore we have a solution of the abelian vortex equation. Okay, so this is the method um, that Oster Garcia Prada was uh, introducing in his thesis. Okay, so are there any questions about the proof? So then let me move on. <clears throat> this theorem by Braldo, Garcia, Prada, and Noguchi identify the moduli space of abelian vortices on a Riemann surface, on a compact Riemann surface, with a, with a symmetric product and symmetric product of the, of the Riemann surface, where n is the degree of the line bundle. And because we are in the case of complex dimension one, this is a smooth manifold. This, this moduli space is a, or carries an interesting Keller metric obtained by infinite dimensional Keller reduction. And it has been studied a lot in the, in the mathematical physics literature, mainly by work by Manton and Nuno Romao, eh, Batista and, and other people. So in, in a conference in Cambridge in 2011 that I was attending, eh, Nicholas Manton gave a talk about abelian vortices and posed the following question or make the following comment. He was talking about the moduli space of, of, of abelian vortices and he said that we assume in our talk that vortices have no bar reaction of the metric. There are other vortices which are gravitating like, a, like cosmic strings which have a gravitational effect. So we were like when Oscar Garcia Prada, Luis Alberto Consul, and I were, were in the audience, and we were at the time studying some equations called the Keller Young Mills equations, and we were very pleased 
to hear this thing because as dimensional reduction of these scalar Young-Mills equations, we actually obtain a natural candidate for, for this uh, gravitating vortex geometry. So the two questions I, I would like to address next is, well, which equations describe mathematically these gravitating vortices on a Riemann surfaces? And um, what is the structure of, of, its, of its moduli space? Okay. So if there are no comments or questions, let me move to the, to the next part. Okay, so let's go to, let's move to, to gravitating vortices. <clears throat> so as I was mentioning, uh, motivated by the study of these Keller and Mills equations on higher dimensions, uh, jointly with Alvarez Consul and Garcia Prada, we introduce a notion of vortex on a Riemann surface, which has a bar reaction of the metric, it means that the vortex specifies the vortex itself is kind of a specifying a preferred metric. It's, it has it's, it has a reaction. It's, it's not a, the 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 Keller metric is not free in the in the in the story. So the definition is as follows. So you take L to be a holomorphic Lenz bundle over a Riemann surface sigma. We fix a section phi a holomorphic section as before, and then we fix two parameters. One is tau, which appeared before in the abelian vortex equations, and the other one is another parameter alpha. Which, if you if you like this analogy with physics, alpha is going to be something like the gravitational constant. <clears throat> it's going to measure the, the, the gravitational interaction. Then the gravitating vortex equations for for a pair G and H, where G is a Keller metric on the on the Riemann surface, and H is a Hermitian metric on L, are given by the following two equations. It's a couple system of equations given by the following. So the first equation, we are now familiar with it. It's just the abelian vortex equation that I introduced before. But now the Keller metric is constrained and depends also on the holomorphic section in the following, in the following form. So the scalar curvature of the metric plus alpha times Laplacian plus tau acting on this function has to be constant. Okay, this is the this is the, the constraint that we, that we put. So this constant C, which appears in the second equation, in the scalar equation, <clears throat> is topological once we fix uh, the parameters alpha and tau, and is given by the following expression. So C is two pi times the area characteristic of the surface minus two alpha tau n, n is the degree of the Lehmann law, divided by the volume, okay? So uh, what I would like to do next is briefly motivate the equations. Okay, tell you why why these equations are interesting and how do they relate to to physics in a particular situation. So the third, the first thing I would like to to say is related to these Keller Young Mills equations that I mentioned that we were studying in relation to to the proof of Garcia Prada of the existence and uniqueness of vortices. So. Assume that we are in the same setup as, as we had for this uh, Garcia Prada Noguchi Braldo theorem. So we consider the SU2 equivariant bundle on the product of the, the surface time, times the Riemann sphere, determined by phi, which is given by a holomorphic extension of the pullback of L uh, by the pullback of, uh, of O2. Then what we showed is that these gravitating vortex equations are equivalent to some natural equations in higher dimensions in this complex surface. So for fixed tau and alpha, the gravitating vortex equations admit a solution with Keller form omega, omega is in the Riemann surface, if and only if x, which is this complex surface, and e, which is this rank two bundle, admit a solution that they call gxh, where gx is a Keller metric on the complex surface, and H is a Hermitian metric on the bundle E, of the following equations. So the first of these two equations are the Hermitian Einstein equations that appeared before in the proof of, uh, of Garcia Prada. <clears throat> and these are equivalent to the slope pole stability of the bundle. The second equation is more mysterious and is more in the realm of the constant scalar curvature Keller problem 
because it couples the scalar curvature of the given Keller metric with this other quantity, which represents, I mean, it's a trace of a, a two-two form which represents the bond tracking class or the second chain class of the, the second chain character of the bundle. So this is scalar curvature minus alpha times the trace two times with respect to the metric of the endomorphism trace of the curvature of H wedge the curvature of H. So this equation is that this combination of, of curvatures needs to be constant. Okay, and again, this is a, some constant which depends on the topology of, of the manifold. And in order to match the gravity of the equations with these Kellerian mills, one needs to take a careful choice of Keller form. It's not for any Keller form, but one needs to take the one, the one that Garcia Prada took is like the pullback of, of omega, where omega is the Keller metric on the Riemann surface, plus this combination uh, for over tau of the pullback of the Fubini story metric on P1. Okay, so this is the idea. Okay, so if you are interested in the Keller and Mills equations, that's great. If not, let me tell you that you obtain some important information for the gravity in borders equations out of this proposition, which is uh, the following. So the upshot of this proposition is that the gravity in borders equations automatically inherit an infinite dimensional moment map interpretation from the Keller and Mills equation. So the, the reason why we initiated the study of these equations is because they appear naturally in a moment map construction, in an infinite dimensional moment map construction, which uh, couples the familiar story for, for the Atilla, uh, Atilla bot Donaldson uh, symplectic structure in the space of unitary connections with the, with the Fujiki Donaldson um, symplectic structure in the space of almost complex structures. And yeah, this, if you are interested in this, in this story, you can go to this paper uh, published in, in 2013, where you have more details about it. But for us, the, the most important thing is that now we have learned that gravitating vortices are naturally zeros of a moment map. And this is going to be important for, for part of my talk. So the other thing I would like to mention is a physical interpretation of the equations in a very particular case. The case where the constant C, which appears in the gravitating vortices equations is zero. So let me go back because possibly you don't remember what this constant is. So this constant, which appears in the gravity inverse equation is given by this formula, okay? So if we, if we assume that C is zero, then automatically, because we are assuming that alpha and tau are positive, then the Euler characteristic uh, has to be positive, and therefore we are forced to be in a Riemann surface, uh, sorry, in, a, in, a, in the Riemann sphere, in, the, in, the, in P1, okay? So in this case, that's is zero, one finds uh, some equations that physics call the einstein bogomoni equations. This is similar, or the spirit is the same as uh, when, you, when they call uh, bogomoni equations to the, to the abelian vortex equation. So here, <clears throat> what, you, what you have is some solutions, special solutions of Einstein equations, coupled with an electromagnetic field and a Higgs field, which describe certain phase transitions in the, in the early universe. So the idea is that now, instead of the wave function of, for, the, for the electron, the phi represents the, the Higgs field, the one which appears in, in, the, in the standard model. <clears throat> and then uh, in, the, in the early stages of the universe, uh, the phi needs to go to a minimum of the potential for the Higgs field, which is this one. If you, you can picture it in, uh, in this uh, Mexican hat shape. And as phi goes to a minima, then uh, you, there is a, a breaking in, in the symmetry. So in this point of high energy, and uh, the configuration is symmetric, to, to go to a minimum of the potential, you need to choose a, a direction. So what this, what this, is, what this uh, causes is some specific, I mean, conjecturally, some specific regions in, the, in a space time where there is a, a <clears throat> a very high concentration of, of energy density. So let me show you another picture, which maybe is more, is more clear. Let me show you this. So our Riemann surface would be transverse 
to this uh, topological defect called cosmic string. So the cosmic string is a, in a space, is a one dimensional object, in a space time will be a two dimensional object. So if we freeze time or we think that our solutions are static, then what we have is, is a infinitely long um, one dimensional object, which is uh, which has a, a very high concentration of energy. And in the transverse directions, we have our Riemann surface, which appears in the definition of the of the gravitating Bohr's equations. So typically, when there is no uh, when there is no um, electromagnetic field, so when there is no connection, what happens is that the solutions for these uh, uh, cosmic string equations develop a, a deficit angle. So you get a, a cone metric. And this causes some um, <clears throat> effects that can be observed in, um, conjecturally observed in, in nature. Okay, so this is just for the, for the motivation of, of the equations. On the one hand, they are related to these keller young mills equations, <clears throat> which are related to modular spaces of, of bundles and, and varieties in higher dimensions. On the other hand, in the special case that C is zero, they are related to an actual gravitational problem uh, given by this cosmic string uh, uh, objects. So if there are no further questions, let me now go for existence results in just in the, in the mathematics uh, setup. Are there any comments or questions about this problem? Okay, <clears throat> so if not, let me, let me go for the math. And the first result I would like to mention is for genus bigger or equal than two. So take functions uf and consider the following rescale the metric, Keller metric on, on the manifold and Hermitian metric on the line bundle for a suitable background geometry. Then the gravity in borders equations that I showed you before for gh are equivalent to the following system of PDE. This is a semi-linear system of PDE where the only differential operator is the Laplacian of the background metric acting on both U and F. And the rest is some nonlinear mess, which involves the two, the two functions, UF exponentials and the norm phi squared with respect to the background metric. Okay. <clears throat> then the thing that we can prove, and we prove it in this in this paper and recently published in, in Math and Allen, jointly with Alvarez Consular, Tia Prada, and, and Bamsi Pingali, is that if you have a compact Riemann surface with genus bigger or equal than two, then there exists a solution of the gravitating vortex equations with volume two pi provided by the following, uh, the following conditions hold. So this, first condi this second condition is just the condition that we found in the theorem by Garcia, Prada, Noguchi, and Braldo which characterizes the existence of the first equation of vortices, which is essentially this equation here, when you freeze U, okay? The second equation is more interesting. The second constraint on alpha is more interesting. Uh, it just tells us that there is a suitable range of, of, of the coupling constant alpha for which we can solve the, the PDE. And the way we, we prove this thing is via the continuity method using the natural continuity path given by alpha. Okay, so at alpha equals to zero, you can solve the PDE uh, just by taking the constant scalar curvature kilometric and an abelian vortex for it. And then from there, you can deform. And using the fact that on a Riemann surface with, with high uh, with high genus, you don't have automorphisms, essentially you, you, you are done. Okay, I mean, there are, there are, uh, and this is for openness, and then, then you have to do a priori estimates and so on. Let me not go much into the details of this thing because I want to focus on the on the positive case in this talk. Okay, but uh, you can certainly do this for <clears throat> for genus bigger than two. Let's assume now that c equals to zero, which is the physically relevant case. So if c, the constant which appears in the gravity divorce equation, is zero, then as I told you, sigma needs to be P1 because the Euler characteristic is, is forced to be positive. And then the alpha has to be one over tau when it's fixed. 
<clears throat> then this einstein bogomolny equation is reduced to a single PDE for a function in the two sphere. Let me show you why, it's very simple. So if you take this system of equations here and you take C equals to zero, so C only appears in this term, right? Then these equations tell you that the Laplacian of U is completely determined by F, putting this into the other side. And then you are left with one equation for F, which is semi-linear, okay? So <clears throat> we have this single PD on the, on the Riemann sphere, which depends on a configuration of, of points in, in P1 with multiplicities, which is given by the divisor corresponding to the section phi. Then there is this theorem by Ji Song Yang that he proved in 95 and 97 in two papers, which uh, he sets essentially the, the existence of solutions under suitable constraints on the multiplicities of the divisor. So let's assume that D is the divisor corresponding to the pair L phi. So these are the PIs are the, the vanishing of the, the points where the, the section vanishes and the NIs are is the multiplicity where it vanishes. Then assume that the multiplicities at any point are smaller than the total degree divided by two. If this is the case, then there exists some big constant B zero, much bigger than four pi n divided by tau, says that the Einstein-Mogomolny equations, which are just this PDE, admit a solution on any Keller class says that the volume is much is bigger than this B0. So we have existence for, for very large volume, so for very large Keller class. Recall that we are on the sphere, so we just, we just have one line of Keller class. <clears throat> Assume now that uh, D is, uh, is, has just two points with the same multiplicity. Okay, then you have a nice S1 symmetry given by putting these two, two points in antipodal points and rotating along the, the, the vertical axis. Then in this case, the einstein bogomolny equations admit a solution in any clear class says that the volume is bigger than four pi n divided by tau. And furthermore, the solution is, is one symmetric in this case. Okay, so let me briefly comment on the proof or maybe not. Let me not comment on the proof. Let me skip this. Let me move on to, 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 the, to the meaning of this thing. If someone asks, I can go back to it. So of course, uh, we are complex geometers. So we know that the condition in, in Jack's theorem correspond to, to the demand for JT stability for, for the action of SL2C on the, on the symmetric power of, of P and N times, where N is the total degree of the, of the line map, right? So these conditions that appear in, in, in Jan's theorem just tell us that the corresponding divisor is polystable. And the two different cases are the strictly stable case or the strictly polystable case. Then it is natural to ask if there is a converse. And we proved this in a, in a paper, in the paper that I mentioned before recently published, uh, and this is a statement. So if you have constants of and tau positive, and you have the divisor corresponding to P1 and the section, if P1 L phi admits a solution of the gravity in vortex equations, then the following holds. So re notice here that I'm not assuming that C equals to zero, uh, C can be anything. So it is for the general gravity in vortex equations on P1. Then the following hold. The volume has to be bigger than four pi n divided by tau. And this is just the, the consequence of the, of the abelian vortex equation. And the other one is that the D is polystable with respect to the SL2C action on SN, uh, SNP1. So recall that being polystable is just either that this holds or this holds, okay? So the, the method uses this moment map uh, uh, interpretation a lot. So the, the idea is the following. You have an, an analog of the, of the Mabushi energy, which depends on alpha and tau. And this, this Mabushi energy is convex along geodesics. And now automorphisms 
of P1 produce geodesics. And this is what you use. And the other thing you need to, to know is a formula for the Futaki invariant. And the Futaki invariant is given by this very explicit formula once you have fixed uh, a point uh, in the divisor. Okay, so this tells you that the, if the Futaki invariant for a degenerative operation has to has to uh, vanish, then the, the the limiting configuration has to be uh, strictly polystable. That's the idea. And then the, the initial the initial guy has to be uh, at least uh, yeah, semi-stable. Oh, sorry, <clears throat> stable or, or polystable. Anyway, so this is the, the idea of the of the conversion. So are there any comments or questions? Okay, so if not, let me go for, for the case of main interest in this talk, which is the existence for, for C equals to zero. And as we will see in the course of the proof, uh, the constraint on C being positive implies that the, the scalar curvature of the metric we saw the, this gravity in both equations has to be positive. So this is the case of positive curvature. <clears throat> so let's assume that alpha is bigger than zero in the equations and that the constant C is also bigger than zero. So as before, as we had for this einstein bogomolnyi case, this implies that sigma has to be P1 and the constant needs to be between zero and one over tau n, the constant alpha, right? Uh, this is P1, the other characteristic is two, and this being positive in places. We want to solve these equations. So the theorem that we prove, jointly with uh, Bamsi Pingali and Chen Yang Yao in, in a preprint uh, in 2019 in archive, <coughs> is the following. So let the be an effective divisor on P1 corresponding to the period of phi, and then fix tau and alpha, such that alpha is between zero and one over tau n. So this is the case that C is bigger than zero. Assume that D is SLT, SL2C polystable, as we had in the, in the previous term. Then the gravity in borders equations admit a solution with complete constant alpha for any Keller class says that the volume is bigger than four pi n divided by tau. Okay, so this, this term completely solves the existence uh, problem for, for gravity in vortices in the case that the constant C is positive. And there is a strong, a strong analogy with uh, the, the keller einstein problem uh, in the case of, of, phanoma, of phanoma manifolds in, in, this, in this case. <clears throat> of course, there is a converse for this thing given by the previous term that I mentioned with uh, Bamsi Pingali, Garcia Prada, and Alvarez Consul, which tells you that if you have a solution, then necessarily uh, you are in the in the polystable case. Okay, so let me explain the idea and what are the difficulties for, for implementing this idea. So this is just the theorem again. So if you read it, don't read it again. So the idea is to apply the continuity method in the parameter alpha, as we did for, for genus bigger than two. But here we need to start a Young solution, the one provided by Young's theorem, which is the case that alpha is precisely equal to one over tau n. So we are in the in the in the uh, in the right uh, extreme of the of the interval for alpha. The reason why you cannot go you can start with the with the other side from the other side in this in this case of the Riemann surface in the Riemann sphere is uh, well there are two there are two problems one obvious problem is that when alpha goes to zero you have constant scalar curvature and then you have the Fubini story metric which has a lot of symmetries and morally these symmetries are obstructing your your solution being pushed away from alpha equals to zero that's the the most naive uh, the most naive thing. There are more complicated. There are more complicated uh, obstructions for doing this related to to a priori estimates. But let, let me <clears throat> let me just skip that. So, what are the difficulties in implementing this method? There are mainly three difficulties. So, the first one is that Young results only holds for very big volume if V is not the symmetric case. 
So we need to do something about uh, his uh, his solutions because he only proved he only managed to prove that the volume was probably big. <clears throat> the by the way this this part is not in the preprint, but we realized we realized last year and we are we are adding this to the to the preprint in a, in a resubmission. So the other possible difficulty is that S1 symmetry in the case, in the strictly polystable case, potentially obstruct openness for applying the continuity method. This is another problem. And finally, the, the most challenging problem is that if you aim to, to uh, apply the continuity method, then you, you need to rule out the formation of singularities on a sequence of solutions when you, when you take your capping constant alpha k going to alpha zero, where alpha zero is between zero and one over tau. Okay, so you need to do something about it by a priori estimates and the chicken gromov theory that, that I'm going to explain now. Okay, so as for the first difficulty, what happens with uh, with young solutions that we only have for big volume? Well, uh, we managed to prove the following that if you have a, an effective ice on P1 corresponding to L5, assume that this is stable with respect to the SL2C action. So this is the, the strictly stable case because in the strictly polystable case, the solutions of Yang uh, match all possible Kerr classes. Then the SM homogeneous equations, that is the case C equals to zero, admit a solution on any Kerr class says that the volume is bigger than four pi in divided by tau. I'm not going to comment much on this proof because it essentially follows by the same methods that we prove that the solution can be deformed from Young solution to, to, the, to the interior of the interval. But the idea is to start with Young solution at large volume and then apply the continuity method with parameter the volume, so the Keller class. Because you just have one, one, one line of Keller classes, then you can do this. And this requires the use of chicken gromov theory. And in the strictly polystable case, you need to apply some lebron Simanka type argument to be able to, to perturb a little bit around a given solution. Okay, so now we have solutions of these einstein mogomoni equations in any admissible Kelly class, and let's deform them. So as I told you, there is a problem uh, regarding openness when we are in the strictly polystable case. So when we have two points with multiplicities given by the total degree divided by two, the two points. But now you can solve this in the following in the following way. So you take uh, the divisor corresponding to L5 and assume that D is polystable with respect to the SL2C action. Then we prove that the existence is, is, is an open condition for alpha. And how do you do that? Well, if D is stable, this essentially follows by the moment map uh, argument. So you, you have a you just apply the implicit function theorem and identify elements in the kernel with uh, with uh, infinitesimal automorphisms, and and then you are you are there. That's the idea. The complicated case is the strictly polystable case. Then we apply the following theorem, which is or can be compared with the with the so-called lebrun simanka argument for constant scale curvature Keller metrics. So what we what we proved in this in a paper jointly with Alvarez Consul, Garcia Prada, and we adapt to the case of, of vortices in the paper with Pingali and Ja, is that if you give a solution of the of the gravity interbornist equations with alpha bigger than zero, any alpha, then if you take a nearby alpha prime, then there exists a notion of extreme upper for this alpha prime with a yeah, there is an extreme pair with this coupling constant alpha prime. So let me say by words what, what an extreme pair is. So recall what, what, ex, with, what an extreme metric is for, for in Keller geometry. So an extreme metric is a Keller metric says that the scalar curvature is the potential for a Hamiltonian killing vector field, right? In this setup where you have two ingredients, you have like a scalar curvature and this other mess coming from the from the equation here 
and then you have this other equation, what you do is to produce a vector field in the total space of the line bundle. So this first equation, if it is not satisfied, it may give you the potential for a Hamiltonian killing vector field on the base. And then you use the churn connection to lift it to the total space of the line bundle. And coupled with this function, sort of as an endomorphism, this gives you a this should give you a, a holomorphic vector field on the total space of the line bundle. That's the notion of extrema. Okay. So then the idea is that, okay, if I give you a, a solution of the gravity thin borders equations, then you can deform it for nearby alpha prime, but the price you pay is that the deform, the deform metric, the deform pair of metrics omega and h may, may not be a solution, but at least it's an extremal pair. But now there is a general principle that if your Futaki invariant vanishes, then an extreme pair is precisely a solution of the equations. And then because we are assuming that this poly stable, the Futaki invariant vanishes, and then any extreme pair is a gravity thin vortex. Okay. So this is the idea for the for the openness in the in the Srilly poly stable case. So now let me go in the last uh, may I take five more minutes, sorry, because I, I'm a bit uh, no, no problem. Okay, thanks. Of course. <clears throat> thanks. So let me go now to, to, to the main point, which is what happens along a sequence. So the, the, the last difficulty is that we need to rule out the formation of singularities on a sequence of solutions when taking the parameter alpha k to alpha zero, where alpha zero is between zero and one over tau divided by. So this is achieved in, in several steps. The first step is to rephrase the equations in a, in a Riemannian way, from a Riemannian point of view. So a tuple given by, I'm going to be a bit pedantic here, but it's necessary because I need to free the complex structure. Okay. So a tuple sigma L phi, where sigma is a Riemann surface with genus zero, L is a holomorphic length bundle over sigma, phi is a holomorphic section, G is a Kellen metric there, H is a Hermitian metric on the line bundle, alpha is some constant, positive, and tau is some positive constant. This thing solves the gravity thin borders equations. If and only if the following tuple, G eta tau, solves this other equation. So let me tell you what is this G eta tau. So G is just a smooth Riemannian metric on the, on the twist sphere, the, the smooth twist sphere, no complex structure. Eta is a smooth closed real two form on the two sphere, says that the total integral of over the two sphere is two pi n. So of course this is going to be the curvature of, of, of something, right, on the line model. And then this phi is a smooth function on S2, which is non-negative, and which is precisely vanishing at the pJs. And I record that log of phi is uh, locally integrable. <clears throat> then this triple has to satisfy the following equations. So eta plus one half phi minus tau volume equals to zero. The Laplacian of log phi is tau minus phi minus this, minus this distributional term, which is precisely located at the, at the, at the bunch of points where your phi vanishes. Then the scalar curvature of the metric plus alpha Laplacian plus tau acting on phi minus tau equals to constant C. And the way you go from one to the other is you apply the Poincaré long term. Uh, and then the sigma, the Riemann surface corresponds to S2J, where J is the complex structure determined by G. This phi, this density state function is, is norm phi squared. And the eta is I times the, times the curvature. Okay. So you write you rewrite things in, in this remaining way. The second step is to to prove a priori estimates for these equations for these remaining we call these remaining gravity importance equations R G B. So if you have a solution, then you have bounds on the state function between zero and tau. The total the total curvature the total integral of, of of the state function is precisely tau minus two n up to to pi. Then you have an estimate on the scalar curvature 
which must be between C and this other mess. And this is what gives the name to my token to the paper, because, because we are assuming that C is bigger than zero, the scalar curvature needs to be positive. And then we have a, another state function estimate, which tells you things about derivatives, Laplacian of the, of the phi, okay? Between minus chi squared divided by four and this other quantity, okay? So now we, we have the, the, main, the main point, which is once you have this rewriting of the equation in terms of the Riemannian system and these priori estimates, you can prove the following. So let gn, eta n, phi n be a sequence of solutions of the Riemannian gravity in vortex equations with alpha n going to alpha zero, where alpha zero is between zero and one over tau n. Then there exists a sequence of points in SL2c for a suitable choice of compression structure, so that the pullback of the solution along the so the pullback of, of the solution uh, by sigma n along the sequence converges in C1 beta sense to a smooth solution of the Riemannian gravity in vortex equations with constant alpha zero and divisor in the closure of D, where D is the initial distribution of points, which we call are determined by, by the distributional equation in this RGB, okay? And now let me just in one minute comment the proof, but essentially I want to, to uh, apply gk Gromov theory. So by the a priori estimates, the volume is, is bounded along the sequence by, this, by these inequalities. And the diameter of gn is also bounded by, by Bonnet's estimate like this. Now by the relative volume comparison theorem, the volume ratio by the, the ball of genes, or this is a typo, divided by pi r squared is bigger, bigger or equal than two divided by the diameter r squared. Then by Chigge Chrome of Taylor, we have an estimate on the inactivity radius, which remains positive and this is independent of n. And finally, by the a priori estimates, we have uniform bones on the scalar curvature and the derivatives of the scalar curvature along the sequence. And then the statement follows by Chigge Gromov compactness. So what, what Chigge Gromov compactness tells you is that there exists a sequence of diffeomorphisms, which says that the pullback of your, of your, uh, of your, of your metrics converge in a suitable sense. And here we need to refine this to an automorphism for the given complex structure, okay? And this can be done using a suitable slice theorem for, for complex structures. So recall that on, on, on the two sphere, all complex structures are isomorphic. And this is what we use, okay? And essentially this finishes the proof. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, are there any uh, questions or, or remarks, first of all? Um, yeah, I, I have a question. It's uh, probably, uh, uh, so you, you analyze the situation when you have a, a surface and, and a line bundle, essentially. So what, what happens if you have a high dimensional base and consider the problem? Do, do you expect any any resolution to, to, to this type of correspondence, stability equivalence with, with solutions? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, so of course you can consider this with minor modifications, you can consider this gravity in Bohr's equations in a, in, a, in a higher dimensional manifold. Mm -hmm. and, and the expectation is that, yes, there should be some stability condition that, um, Precisely captures the existence of solutions. The, 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 honestly, I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, in, this, in this case, where, where you have only one complex structure, then essentially everything reduces to the stability of the divisor. So I guess in homogeneous manifolds, uh, like, like in flag manifolds or so, and so on, one can prove a similar result says that the the existence reduces to just the the stability 
of the divisor with respect to the automorphism group of the manifold. But in general, I don't know how to formulate the, the stability condition. I mean, we, we tried for these Keller and Mills equations, and that was very hard. And I still don't know what is the, the good stability condition to we should be equivalent to, to this. Thing. I mean, not even, I, I don't have even the, a guess uh, of what it should be. Uh, did you discuss the uh, uniqueness uh, uh, in the talk? Uh, no, 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 not at all. Uh, this is a, a difficult and interesting problem. We we have made some some progress lately on this thing, but we we don't know yet the answer. So the because of this moment map framework, there is a notion of geodesic in the space of metrics and so on, which is adapted to the problem. This alpha alpha Mabuchi energy is convex along along geodesics, and one can try. Um, uh, something al along the lines of, of the proof of uniqueness for CSCK, uh, but we still don't have a. But, but in in the in the negative case, a wide simpler situation uh, uh, is not known either. No, 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 we don't know. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, you have seen that I was a, a paper. Oh yeah, of... sorry, sorry, I I, uh, I I'm cheating. I'm ah. saying something which is wrong. In the negative case, we prove uniqueness of solutions for this range of the parameters, just by applying some uh, like a backwards argument for the for the. I mean, because you have uniqueness in alpha equals to zero, then you can ex extend the uniqueness uh, along Close the parameter. But, but yes. it's not it's not a first principle proof, so we we don't have a a proof. The least proof of the of this fact. Yes. Yeah. A natural proof of the fact. We don't have a natural proof. And also we don't know, I mean, this result is not optimal. So actually there are, if you have solutions for this, for this value of alpha, then for, uh, for this value plus epsilon, you also have solutions, but we don't know how, how long you get from there. So there should be, I mean, there should be a, a method different from ours, such that the, the a priori estimates work for, for bigger, values of alpha, but we don't know how to do that. And possibly you can prove uniqueness using this indirect method, but it would be nice to have a, a first principles proof by using geodesics or something along those lines. You have seen probably there was a, a preprint of uh, Schinzer and Jacopo Stoppa recently, where they address the relationship between uh, Kara Young Mills uh, and uh, uh, deform emission uh, young means uh, uh, connections. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, did you, can you do some comment because I uh, I don't really understand the, the picture. Probably you understand much better than me. So, do you understand this relationship? Uh, well, you got me now because I read this a long time ago. I don't. I don't. Uh, it was November <laughs> <laughs> twenty. <laughs> that's so, so hard. You forgot. No, no. But when I, when I read it through, it was it was. Uh, it was a bit yeah, further away, but anyway, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. They have some parameters, and in some limit, they they recover this. Yeah, this yeah. Young means, but also the the limit that they take is not, I mean, it's not very natural in in some senses. I mean, also it's artificial. It's a bit artificial, but uh, yeah. Also, yeah. you you get some. I mean, the value of the coupling constant is a mess. So you you have this um, this coupling constant here in the keller yang mills equations. And then they start with some parameters and the, the value of alpha that they obtain for these solutions is, is very weird. It depends a lot of the, on the other set of parameters. So I, I, don't, I don't know, but it's very, it's interesting also. They have a, a different limit where they go to this deformed Hermitian um, matrix on bundles. So it's, it's very intriguing, yeah. Uh, what, what is interpretation of the um, of the trace of uh, F A uh, the, the the wage of the curvature the, the second oh. yes this term yes is that oh true? this term yeah what is your interpretation of this term well I still don't have a clear picture about this so if you one thing you can think of 
is that you are trying to construct something like a CSCK metric in the in the total space of the of the principal bundle given by your formation metric. And this is a bit of the scalar curvature of that metric. You, you, you are saying that you can see this uh, uh, second equation as uh, just a scalar curvature of some other object. Yeah, in the, in the total space of, of in an invariant metric in the total space of the of a principal bundle. But for this, you need to, to use the first equation because really the scalar curvature is of this other metric is a scalar curvature minus the norm squared of FH. So using this other thing, you get the, the scalar curvature and the total space of this principal bundle. But this is, this is still mysterious to me. Also, these type of terms appear like in in the higher uh, order expansion of, of Berman kernels for, for bundles. But uh, And there is also this paper by Hong, I think it's Hong, yeah. So Hong has a paper where he studies the existence of CSCK metrics on rule manifolds. Mm -hmm. And he finds some condition when the manifold in the base has automorphisms, which is related precisely to this, to this term here. So in the in the case where you where the base does doesn't have any automorphisms, then if the bundle is stable, you can produce the CSEK metrics for very large polarization. But in the case that the base has automorphisms, you need this thing to be constant in a in a suitable sense. So with what I mean is that it's possible that uh, yeah the, the point is that he proves that this needs to be constant for very large polarization. So it is possible that for, if you don't take the limit of large polarization and you still want to insist on CSCK, then you get that some condition along these lines is necessary for constructing a, a CSCK metric on the total space of the, of the room manifold. But this is just an speculation. So I think. Are you saying that this condition is essentially this, um stability condition recently appearing in Dervan Sektan work on vibration. No, no, I, I, I'm not saying that. And I don't know, I don't know the relation between these two. All I'm saying that is that uh, this is one possibility because when you see this higher order expansion of the Berman ground, this, this terms certainly appear, but I, I kind of tried this with, uh, with uh, Julius Ross time ago, it didn't work, but maybe there is a different method or a way of relating this condition with the with the work by Rui Derbrand and and his collaborator. So, so I'm I'm this is a wild speculation. I, I, I don't know. But in any case, 